So, just like this, we made it into the Middle Bronze Age. Congratulations, us. So this lecture is devoted to the Minoans, or the ancient Cretans, of the Middle and Early Late Bronze Age, or the period between 2000 and 1450 BCE, which is the period that makes my heart sing, so to speak. But let's talk chronology first. We have already talked about the Early Bronze Age, which is the 12th centuries or so, between 3200 to down to 2000 BCE. This was indeed a formative period and in a way prepared things for the emergence of cities and the emergence of civilization, which according to Renfrew, coincided with the emergence of palaces and what we now think is, a state, is the emergence of state-level societies. This is also the juncture when the Greek antiquity as a whole gets strapped onto the chariot of the Western civilization narrative as the Minoan civilization is touted as the emergence of the first European civilization. Right around 2000 BCE, the first palaces or court-centered complexes emerge on Crete. From that point on, the presence and history of the palaces is so influential for the processes uh, uh, overall, and the way we see the developments that Nikolaos Platon, a noted Greek archaeologist, suggested a new chronological system that was based on the palatial phases on the whole island. Therefore, by known archaeology can be tracked according to two different chronological systems, which are complementary, of course. So, the first chronological system tracks chronology according to ceramic phases, and the other one according to broad palatial phases, right, based on architecture. Um, of these two chronological systems, we will primarily use the latter. So. A palatial chronology, but occasionally I'm going to bring up um, ceramic chronologies too. Okay, you're welcome. Therefore, in today's lecture, we're going to examine developments and processes that took place during the proto-palatial period and uh, so, or the old palatial period and later the neo-palatial period on the new palace period. First, let's ask some basic questions. Where were the palaces? And since we're talking about them in the plural, were there more than one? And secondly, what were the palaces? But before we start asking those questions and answering them, let me again introduce you to Sir Arthur Evans, who started the whole thing. So Sir Evans is credited to be as being the father of my known archaeology and he was also the excavator of the palace of Knossos. So he started the whole thing and then later on additional excavations revealed that there were a lot of palaces on the island. So where were they? The first one of course was the palace of Knossos on the north coast commanding the north central part of Crete. The second one was, if we're going to the east, right, was the Palace of Maya, seen here, only 37 kilometers or about 23 miles away from the Palace of Knossos to the east. Going eastward, the third palace was on the east coast of Crete, and that was the Palace of Zakros a palace with obvious an obvious orientation to the eastern Mediterranean and the southeastern part of the Aegean. The south coast, especially the south central part of the Mesara and the large plain where most of the Tholoi were concentrated, was commanded by the palace of Festos. And last but not least, on the western part of Crete, archaeologists uncover under the modern city of Hanya, the remains of what they suggested might have been a palace, which remains sort of hypothetical until more excavations are conducted to ascertain its presence under the modern urban overburden. But let's return to our list of questions. 
the second question we posed earlier is what were those palaces, right? So here, in order to explore my known palaces, we will use as our template the plan of the Palace of Knossos, but expect to find similar components in all the other palaces of the island. So palaces were large, at least three story high building complexes centered around a courtyard, which was always oriented north south. They all seem to be equipped with large storerooms called magazines and workshops producing various types of luxury goods. Last but not least, there is uh, also a cultic component included in the palaces, a shrine here of a sort, uh, always abutting the central courtyard on the west side of the palace uh, and at Knossos, the shrine area of the old palace period is called the Temple Repositories and the Tripartite Shrine. All in all, the palaces were sprawling maze-like complexes surrounded by equally sprawling urban areas, which are not obviously visible today. Their maze-like appearance probably gave rise to the myth of the Minotaur, which was said to reside under the Palace of Knossos and devour an annual tribute of seven boys and seven girls from Athens brought to King Minos, the King of Knossos. The impressive appearance, which was been reconstructed like so, was only matched by the amenities that they were equipped with amenities like a drainage system that was meant to drain excess water from the palaces as well as, well as an underground terracotta hydraulic system to bring in fresh water. I'm telling you, these amenities is what wowed me in my first archaeology class in college and caused me to change my mind and my major, for better or for worse. Definitely for better. Such amenities would take another 1500 years after the Minoans to be reinvented and implemented by the Romans, and it has obviously hit or miss ever since. Similarly, the architects of the palaces took care of ventilation and lighting, with uh, something that's called the pier and door partition scheme, which would allow the control of the elements depending on the weather conditions, as well as light wells interspersed throughout the palace uh, that basically allowed ample light to come in. These architectural features as well as the general appearance of the palaces have also been based on various depictions of houses such as the town mosaic that was found in the temple repositories at Knossos, more on that in just a little bit, or house models like this one from Arhanes as well as depictions of architecture on wall paintings. But let's talk function as we're talk taking a tour of the various parts of the palace, the parts that I pointed out on the plan before. So let's start with the storage magazines that can be found on the west wing of the palace. There are 19 oblong storerooms overall. In their floors, as we can see here on the picture, there were compartments for storage. And apart from the, those compartments, their walls were lined with large clay storage jars called pithoi. There were obviously all types of size and sizes of pithoi, but the ones in Knossos are impressively large. 150 of the estimated 400 that used to exist in the Palace of Knossos are preserved today, and those would hold food and other supplies needed by these complexes for ceremonies and supporting the population of workers and dependents, and of course, elite in the palace. The ceremonies and rituals that the palaces were known for um, would happen in the central court which, as we mentioned earlier, is a must for a Minoan palace. 
It was almost certain that these ceremonies had a ritual or religious component, since one of the most prominent apartments opening up into the central court was a series of rooms interpreted as a shrine, the so-called repo temple repositories and the tripartite shrine. Here's what the western facade of the court would have looked like back in the day, with a tripartite shrine indicated for you over there. Behind the facade of the tripartite shrine, there were two cysts, deep enough to fit a standing person, as you can see in the picture. And in there, there was a host of stuff. A large quantity of vases, 150 clay seal impressions, ivory and bone objects, bronze clamps and handles of wooden chests, crystal petals and discs, heaps of painted seashells, marble, a marble cross, several faience objects were among the finds of this most amazing collection of uh, objects. Among the most impressive were the faience figurines. These were female figurines with elaborate bell-shaped skirts, tight bodices that left the breasts uncovered, and hats or headdresses on their heads. Both of them drew Evans's attention and he named them snake goddesses for obvious reasons. One was holding a snake in each hand and the other one has snakes slithering all over her. Evans claimed that they were portrayals of the goddess, suggesting that the Minoan pantheon was topped by female goddesses representing aspects of the mother, mother goddess that a number of Eastern Mediterranean civilizations had in their pantheon. As the work was soon discovered by seeing additional archaeological evidence, the appearance of the snake goddesses was the standard but most likely formal dress code for Minoan women. Therefore, on ritual occasions, the central court of Knossos and the other palaces would be full of women dressed to the nines, like Eric Schanauer has imagined in this illustration from his numerous graphic novels. One of these ritual occasions probably was a bull-leaping ritual occasion, as this artist's rendering is showing. Again, the evidence for this sports activity comes from wall painting. A wall painting that survives from the Palace of Knossos allows us to perhaps reconstruct this acrobatic event. In the painting, a large bull is charging ahead. In front of the bull, there is an athlete with long locks and a loincloth grabbing the bull by the horns. Another athlete is portrayed standing upside down on the bull's back, whereas a third one is depicted behind the bull in a stance that one assumes when landing on their feet after a jump, with her arms outstretched in front of her. My choice of the pronoun her for the first and the third athlete in the sequence is not arbitrary. The Minoans and the Mycenaeans, just like other cultures in the Mediterranean, use different colors to distinguish genders in visual representations, darker for males and lighter skin tones for females. Therefore, according to the artist here, both boys and girls dressed identically with a loincloth participated in this sport. So in all likelihood, the wall painting I showed you before depicts the three stages of the sport. So the athlete would grab uh, onto the horns of the charging bull, then land, right, to fly off in the, the air and then land on the bull's back before jumping off right behind the bull. By the way, this sporting or ritual activity, note here that bulls were very important in my known religious ritual, was very popular and we find these representations not only on this wall painting but a number of different media like you see on the slide here. But was this board possible the way it has been reconstructed? Most likely not. 
and it probably looked something like this. So this is an example of the many daring jumps that modern recordadores from Spain perform in front of probably very annoyed bulls. Actually, the pose of the recordador um, as that he assumes as he flies here over the bull is reminiscent of a ivory statuette from Knossos. Let me show it. The ivory shows a bull leaper probably in mid-flight. However, the sport was practiced. It seems that it was probably a ritual sports activity that was connected to the rites of passage for both boys and girls. The important thing was that it was commonly accepted that one of the settings of these ceremonies were definitely the palaces, which shows us that the palaces functioned primarily, especially in the old palace period, as gathering places for the population of the surrounding communities during ritual occasions. One such ritual occasion is depicted in the so-called tripartite fresco from Knossos or grandstand fresco. This is a heavily reconstructed fresco that nevertheless offers us good evidence about the happenings in the central court. It is called, of course, the tripartite shrine fresco because it actually depicts the west facade of the central court of Knossos and has given us an idea of what the facade and the shrine looked like. It looked something like this. So the depiction of the ceremony in the fresco has inspired discussions about the social structure uh, in Manon society and the relative power of the two genders. It is true that in art, women hold a place of prominence. Here, for instance, they sit up front, in front of a sea of men, right? You can see them in red behind them. Women hold the same prominence in another fresco, the sacred grove fresco, which is believed that it depicts a ceremony that took place in the western court of the palace. Again, women are shown not only dancing, but actually watching the ceremony from the first rows. If rulers or the ruling elite ever resided in the palaces, they would be located in the south part of the eastern wing of the palace where Evans reconstructed some rooms to, get a, to give the public an idea of what living in a Minoan palace would look like. Right? They also lived on the upper stories that, again, Evans reconstructed. But let's now see what he did with the so-called Queen's Megaron, which is particularly instructive. Here is a drawing of what the artist who helped reconstruct the, uh, the frescoes actually thought that the, what the Queen Megarons looked like. Here is what it looks like today if you were to visit the palace. The frescoes that are on the walls are reconstructions of frescoes that were found in this room during excavation, even though not all the details in this reconstruction are correct. For instance, the dolphin fresco was probably not on a wall, but on a floor. And by the way, there is no good evidence for attributing this area to a queen, other than the cuteness of the frescoes that Evans thought would have been more appropriate for a queen. Last but not least, we should not forget the workshops. Each palace seems to have had an area of probably dependent craftspeople where they worked to produce luxury goods for the Minoan elite. Luxury goods, like this gold pendant from Malia of two bees, which has been produced employing not just one, but a number of metalworking techniques, such as repoussé, granulation, embossing, and filigree. Or this sword pommel, also from Malia, which shows a relief figure of a man in a super contorted position. Or the stone vase from Agia Triada, a princely residence outside of Festos in the south, 
that shows us a group of harvesters probably heading out to the fields for the first day of harvest with musicians accompanying them. This is a pretty remarkable work of art, not only because it's carved out of stone with remarkable artistry, but because it is one of the few representations of actual everyday life. Obviously, everything we've described so far about the palaces paints the picture of very complex structure, a very complex uh, group of operations. And with all these people coming and going and all these goods doing the same thing, basically coming in and going out, um, obviously they needed some sort of form of accounting and keeping track of it all. And indeed, Minoans had an accounting system from early on the protopalatial period, and here's the evidence for it. We have uncovered sealed documents, roundels and nodules, as well as seals that produce these sealings. Check out some of them in the collection of seals in the lower left corner of the slide, or signet rings like the one you see on the upper right corner, the one that I've blown up. The so-called master impression that I'm showing you here on the slide, this one, was produced from one of these seals, which, by the way, were most likely personal and would have been used in lieu of your signature. Therefore, every time somebody would send you commodities or gifts, um, you would, he would seal them with their seal so that the administrators and the receiving end would know where the commodities came from and who sent them. Very important. On the receiving end, the accounting of commodities would happen on tablets of unbaked clay that were preserved for us through an accident of preservation. That is, they were preserved for us when they were baked during the firing destructive episodes in the palaces. The document on the left is the famous Festos disc, um, which preserves the use of Cretan hieroglyphics, a writing code that the Minoan scribes developed shortly inspired by the Egyptian ones and used during the protopalatial period. Soon after, another syllabic script was developed to serve the needs of the palace. The script was called Linear A and emerged in the protopalatial period and continued to be used during, throughout the end of the neopalatial period. Another burning question is who ruled all of this, right? Well, in contrast to the other uh, palatial societies in the Eastern Mediterranean, this is actually a difficult question to address. So, in my known Crete, the absence of ruler iconography or the lack of good evidence for domestic assemblages has led scholars like Jan Driesen and Ilse Schöp to suggest that perhaps we should move away from the term palaces and call them court-focused or court-centered complexes, at least for the protopalatial period. Actually, what I'm showing you on this slide are, to my knowledge, the only two representations of important individuals that could be interpreted as rulers or ruling elites. This curious detail has made some suggest that perhaps the palaces were controlled by competing elite families in the protopalatial period, a situation that seems to change in favor of a smaller group in the neopalatial period, since in the latter period, the palaces are outfitted with architectural solutions that make access to the palaces harder and, as a consequence, more controlled when it comes to the general public. Other curious features, apart from the absence of ruler iconography, are also the general lack of fortifications and the emphasis on warfare in the iconography of the Minoans. These curious features inspired Evans to suggest that uh, Minoans were probably a peace-loving, nature-loving folk in direct contrast with the neighbors to the north, the Mycenaeans. Before we leave this subject, we cannot but bring up 
this very colorful representation of what Evans thought was the priest king. Well, it is not exactly that, because subsequent research showed that there are serious mistakes with his reconstruction, suggesting that it's a composite of many different wall paintings. So here is an extra credit exercise for you. Based on the information that you've taken away from this lecture, both audio and visual, please send me a critique of 500 words of this particular reconstruction. So, here are some tips. Look at the color of the skin, the dress, the headdress. Also look at other visual representations and find parallels for your suggestions and critiques. And then submit this in the extra credit folder on Brightspace by Friday of this week. The end of the MM to B period is marked by destructions. So the end of the old palatial period. Knossos arises from this phase of destructions more powerful than ever, even though all the other palaces got renovated and continued strong. On top of that, there emerges a dense network of smaller palaces and villas or country estates, which seems to bind the network together, making the four palaces the central places of this network, the central places that orchestrated this whole thing. This is also the time that Crete looks beyond its shores, for real, this time. So during the neopalatial period, what was previously a phase of introductions and small-scale interaction now gets a lot more intense. And let me give you some examples. Evidence for the scaling of this intensity is that during this period, evidence from the Eastern Mediterranean archives and archaeological assemblages is more frequent. Take, for instance, these representations of what we think are emissaries coming from the Aegean. These wall paintings are from the walls of uh, the tomb of Rekmire in Egypt, who was a noble and an official in Egypt who served as governor of Thebes, among other things, during the 18th dynasty and the reign of Tutmos III. On the walls of these tombs, we see different delegations bringing gifts. And actually, the identification of these emissaries as coming from the Aegean is partly based on the type of objects they bring, which parallel very nicely with a whole bunch of vessel types that are distinctly Aegean. Another, more recent find, dating also from the 18th dynasty, comes from the capital of Avaris of Tel El Daba. On the walls of what seems to be a royal residence, Excavations uncovered a wall painting that is distinctly Minoan in style and execution. I mean, come on, right? Bold painting. According to Bitak, the excavator of this palace, this wall painting is evidence that an encounter of the upper echelons happened here. That is, he suggests, a royal marriage between Tutmos III and a Minoan princess. But the Minoans did not just have relations with the Eastern Mediterranean, but also with their neighbors in their backyard, the neighbors to the north. As we mentioned above, what was a small scale interaction during the protopalatial period builds to a crescendo of activity in the neopalatial. During this time, there is good evidence that a number of sites in the southern Aegean adopt fashions and practices that were prevalent in the palatial societies of Crete. This process of acculturation or cultural entanglement, if you will, results in the spread of ritual practices, styles of decoration, so for instance for pottery, wall painting, but also women's dress and a host of the technologies such as the potter's wheel, the upright loom, weights and measuring systems, and writing. For all these processes, there is no better example than the island of Thera and the site of Akrotiri. 
right around 1625 BCE, the island of Thera suffered a destruction. The eruption of a very large volcano that now scientists estimate to have been four or five times more powerful than the eruption of Krakatoa in 1883. The eruption actually changed the landscape of the island since the, the center of it collapsed in what you see is now a large underwater caldera. The lava and volcanic ash that the volcano spewed covered all the towns and villages of the island. One of them is Akrotiri that you see marked on the slide. Greek archaeologists, starting in the 60s, uncovered a part of a lovely and lively town with two-story buildings and all their contents. The town, minus its inhabitants who seem to have fled the town in time, were frozen in time, much like the city of Pompeii in Italy. It is in the wall paintings that decorated the buildings of the town that we turn to for the most impressive representations of women mainly involved in ritual and decked out in Minoan-style dresses. Akrotiri and the rest of the Minoanized sites is my field of expertise, and trust me, I can go on forever talking about them. But I think you might agree with me that this lecture has to come to an end, right? So let's do it. This eruption of the Thera volcano was incriminated in the past for the demise of the whole entire Minoan civilization. But even after this theory was put to rest, it is recognized that the disappearance of Akrotiri, an important road in the trade and exchange network of the Aegean, was costly and things started to change right after that. So, the new kids on the block, the Mycenaeans from the Greek mainland, pick up the slack, so to speak, and seem to take over the trade route uh, soon after the eruption of the volcano. Back on Crete, during the LM1B, Knossos is stronger than ever. But after LM1B, well, things start to change. And as I say on the slide, Ruler iconography gets much more prevalent. Take, for instance, the so-called throne room, a later addition to the palace after the Alemondi destruction, which has been accepted by many to usher in a new vibe and perhaps new overlords, not just to the palace, but to Crete as a whole. But let's look at the throne room first. So the room with the throne is located behind a porch leading to a vestibule or an antechamber. The throne room itself takes its name from the alabaster throne, which was set against the north wall of the room. This room was clearly intended for meetings of some sort, during which it was very clear who was in charge, don't you think? Nevertheless, political power also seems to uh, be very closely intertwined with religion, since the throne room is right next to two other rooms, so the inner sanctuary over here and the lustral basin over here, which were also associated with ritual acts. Here's what the room looks like today. The throne is also flanked by wall paintings of griffins, and griffins were mixed mythical creatures, a mix between lion and an eagle, and were powerful symbols of power that derived their ancestry from the Near East and Egypt. So clearly the designers of this throne room wanted the attendants to get the message of who was at the top of the hierarchy. The proponents of this hypothesis, that is that the Mycenaeans conquered Crete, are basing uh, their hypothesis on two main sources of evidence, the so-called warrior burials, that is burials filled with weapons, which is in itself a departure from a prior attitude of de-emphasizing warrior culture, 
And the second piece of evidence is the appearance of a linear language, the language of linear B, that as we're going to find out in the lecture in the lecture in the near future, has been deciphered as Greek. But more of that in the future, as I said. Let's now turn to two very important topics for different reasons. The first one is pottery, and the second one is religion in my known times. During the protopalatial period, the dominant style was the so-called Camares ware. This is a very striking style of pots with floral and geometric motifs executed in light paint on a dark background and highlighted with bright yellow, red, or orange. This very attractive style of pot was actually one of the first detectable exports or gifts to the various places in the Eastern Mediterranean. And I'm saying detectable because there is reference from one archive, at least, that mentions that the Cretans were famous for their leather shoes. But alas, such organic materials do not survive except in exceptional preservation conditions. During the neopalatial period, styles change, but one thing remains the same. The tendency of Minoan artists to cover the entire pot with decoration without sectioning it off, something that later Mycenaeans were very fond of. So in the LM1A period, the decorative style is called the floral style, and in the LM1B, it's called the marine style, for obvious reasons, I hope. As for the metaphysical beliefs of the Minoans, of course we cannot be sure about them because they have not left us textual testimony and whatever they left us is still inaccessible to us. But on the other hand, they have left us archeological evidence that allows us to an extent to put together a rudimentary picture of the religious world. Of course, we have seen these uh, two statuettes earlier well, these two statuettes, as we've mentioned earlier, according to Evans, represent two goddesses of the Minoan pantheon. A pantheon that seems to be predominantly, but not exclusively, female. And much of it revolves around nature and animism. Minoans of the pre-palatial period, as we've mentioned earlier, in the previous lecture, gathered in cemeteries and performed communal ceremonies there, and they continue to do so in the protopalatial period. But now, the list of locations of cult activity lengthens. Of course, we have already mentioned the palaces as being centers of ritual activity, but to the list we have to add domestic shrines, caves, and last but not least, Peak sanctuaries. Peak sanctuaries are sanctuaries on prominent hills where archaeological exploration has located layers of ash, probably for bonfires, and large quantities of animal and human figurines, as well as other types of material culture. Well, Various types of material culture in these sanctuaries actually resemble closely material culture from the palaces, a fact that has given rise to the suggestion that the palatial elites were actually sponsors of cultic activities in these sanctuaries. Another connection between the palaces and the shrines is, that, is the fact that three out of the four palaces have actual uninterrupted sight lines from the palace to the, the peak sanctuary. This is what peak sanctuaries would have looked like based on the design from a stone writing from Zakros. So the same tripartite structure of the cultic building is similar to the tripartite shrine from Knossos that we've seen earlier. Religious symbols were obviously not concentrated only in the big sanctuaries and seem to be pretty much everywhere. So here's a little list, a comprehensive list of my known religious symbols, which are the double axe, horns of consecration, altars, offering tables, kernoi, pillar-shaped stones and battles, and of course, nature. 
And I think that you can find most of these religious symbols in this pretty picture from the Agia Triada sarcophagus. Wait, we have not talked about the Agia Triada sarcophagus. And you're right. So with this cliffhanger, I leave you. Thanks very much for your attention and join me next time for the amazing Mycenaeans and the culture of the Mycenaean and the Greek mainland. And okay, okay, of course, about the Agia Triada sarcophagus. Thank you very much.